from the Kingdom of Ohio, this is O'Culture with Ryan Peverly. Yes, sir, from the heart of it all and a living room somewhere near the birthplace of aviation, this is O'Culture. I am your host, Ryan Peverly, and a friendly little hey yo to those of you joining me for the first time. Speaking of joining me in just a few moments, noble scribe of genre-bending fiction, Mr. John Crowley, he's in the house. Before we get to John, though, since this is the first episode, I do want to talk a little bit about this show and what to expect from it. If you don't want to listen to me ramble on and you're just here to listen to John Crowley, and hey, I don't blame you. But if you want to get straight to the conversation with me and John, just skip ahead to the 11 minute and 55 second mark. That's where you'll find it. So, first things first, here's how you can keep up with the show. We are all over social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Tumblr, Pinterest, Google+, whatever your favorite flavor, we're serving it up. Just search O Culture Podcast, you'll find us. We're also streaming on your app of choice, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play Music, and SoundCloud. You can also listen at oculturepodcast.com. Also on the website, we have a blog featuring content from myself. And if you're familiar with Reddit, there's a great poster on there named 9-11 Body Snatchers. He contributes great original research and insights to the conspiracy subreddit. And he's graciously agreed to write and share some content on our website. His first blog is up right now. It's a short introduction on why he does what he does. Go give it a read, oculturepodcast.com slash blog. So I've given this show a slogan, and that slogan is Esoterica and EDM at 432 hertz. Esoterica because the topics of this show will be a bit esoteric in nature. Fun fact about me, I like to make lists. I sat down and made a list of things I wanted to cover on this show that I just want to kind of run through real quick so you know what kind of topics to expect. Uh, We're going to talk some paranormal phenomena like ghosts, UFOs, psychic abilities, some other things like psychedelics and consciousness, and not only consciousness relating to human beings, but also consciousness relating to plants, animals, and even water. I also dig topics relating to various energy modalities, so something like the electric universe will pop up, as will things like vibrations and frequencies, which I guess can be talked about on a level that relates to universal composition, but also as it relates to things like alternative medicines and healing, kind of a more energetic or spiritual form of biohacking, I suppose. And biohacking in general is something I'm interested in, so we'll talk about that. We'll also touch on some conspiracy theories here and there, although I don't want to get too political, but you know, it will happen from time to time because I do find uh, the deep state stuff fascinating, although some of that isn't really conspiracy theory anymore. It's kind of out in the open if you know where to look. I mean, there are people playing a real-life geopolitical game of risk right in front of us, and a lot of folks don't even realize it, and we all seem to be pawns in that game. Which reminds me, I actually have a conversation with G. Edward Griffin coming up where we talk about the history and creation of the Federal Reserve, as well as this great sort of philosophical slash socioeconomic treatise he puts forward on the problem of collectivism. It's a fascinating idea. I love it. It makes a lot of sense, too. And then, obviously, we'll talk about the occult. Things like magic, alchemy, astrology, spiritualism, mysticism, Gnosticism, divination... Uh, various schools of philosophy and various sorts of folklore and mythology. And to these points, to these conversational subjects and topics, John Crowley and I, we don't really go down any major rabbit holes in this episode, but his fiction writing is knee-deep in some of these topics, particularly Hermeticism and Gnosticism, which we do talk a bit about. I do want to touch on the 432 hertz aspect of this show. Uh, I won't go into too much detail right now, but the gist of it is this. Most everything you hear is recorded at 440 hertz, and studies have shown that that frequency, 440 hertz, is actually detrimental to human health. I've even seen some that put forth the idea that it's detrimental on a genetic level, like a DNA level. Conversely, 432 hertz, which is known as the God frequency, has shown tremendous potential as a healing frequency. 
there's tons of research out there to support this. Uh, search it online if you're interested. I do plan to blog about it and track down a guest or two who know more about it than I do. Like I said, that's the gist of why this show is recorded at 432 hertz. I'm just looking out, man. And I didn't want to mention this, but I feel like I need to just to maybe hedge my bets a little bit here. I'm really going for a 1980s late night AM radio feel to this show, and that includes how the show sounds and is edited. I grew up tuning a dial late at night to listen to Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell, and to be honest, I miss that vintage quality and sound. It's very nostalgic to me, if you couldn't tell from the opening to this show. It's got that sort of a feel to it, I think. And when everyone is spending a lot of time and money and energy on podcast equipment and recording software, which, hey, don't get me wrong, no one wants to listen to a podcast that sounds like shit, but I thought maybe adding a wrinkle to the sound through the recording and editing, not only with the 432 hertz, but with some of that throwback radio sound and feel, I thought maybe that'd make this show a bit unique, but it could completely suck. So if it does suck, let me know through email or social media. I love feedback of all sorts, positive and negative and everything in between. Now the last part of this show, the EDM part, electronic dance music, is something I've been getting into a lot recently. I don't know why, but I figured why not feature some music on the show. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I like music with a groove that makes me want to move, and I just realized that rhymed. But anyway, I've been act- <laughs> but anyway. I've been actively seeking artists to contribute music to the show, artists like Vestron Vulture, who was kind enough to lend me a track to serve as the show's opening theme. Uh, It's called I Want to Be a Robot, tribute to Giorgio Moroder. It's a remix of the classic song Chase by Giorgio Moroder uh, from the film Midnight Express. Chase obviously also serves as the theme song to Coast to Coast AM, which I just mentioned. You can check out Vestron Vulture on YouTube, SoundCloud, and Bandcamp, which are all linked in the show notes. And if you know anyone who makes EDM, or even something similar that again has a nice groove to it, could be indie dance rock, or industrial dance, or whatever, something that makes you want to move, let me know. Send me an email, occulturepodcast at gmail.com. And bonus points if the music sounds like you're drifting through a rave on Miami Beach in 1988. Which is kind of the feel I get from this track that's coming up called Boogie Town by VHS Dreams. Uh, VHS Dreams is one of my favorite EDM artists. Uh, You'll be hearing a lot of music from him on this podcast. If you dig it, check out the VHS Dreams links in the show notes. And don't you dare change that dial because my conversation with John Crowley is on the other side of this hashtag sick track. Enjoy!
All right, John Crowley is here. John's an American author of fantasy fiction and mainstream fiction. And what John does really is blends those genres together, puts them in a cauldron of sorts, does some hocus pocus stuff, and then out comes an award winning novel. John is currently a senior lecturer in English and creative writing at Yale University. He's perhaps best known for his novel Little Big, which won the World Fantasy Award for Best Novel in 1982. He's also the author of The Egypt Cycle, a series of four novels which revolve around much of the same themes of Little Big, uh, hermeticism, memory, family, and religion. Honestly, John is one of my all-time favorite writers, and it's my honor to welcome him to O Culture. John, how are you, man? Hi, Ryan. I'm good. Uh, hey, just so I know, I am pronouncing your name correctly. Right? Um, I've heard Crowley and Crowley, but it is Crowley, right? It's Crowley, yes. It's a funny thing. There are two, uh, there are two names that, uh, um, that I think at one point were pronounced somewhere uh, in between Crowley and Crowley. <laughs> Some Crowley names drifted in one direction and the other Crowley names drifted in the other. I was always under the impression that Crowley was an Irish pronunciation, and Crowley was an English or British pronunciation. Yeah, you know, I've only really ever ran across, at least in popular culture, one other person who shares your last name, and that's Alistair Crowley, or Crowley, but he's a bit different from you in terms of background, I would think. And he was an English Crowley. Yeah, it's an odd thing that, uh, an odd fact, um, at the Ransom Center, Harry Ransom Center in Texas, which is this huge... I don't know if you know it, but it's one of the largest uh, archives of literary material mm -hmm. in America and the world, maybe. I don't know. Uh, they have, you know, all kinds of uh, writers' uh, materials there, and they have mine. But they have a bunch of mine, anyway. And mine are, by alphabetical coincidence, right around the corner from Aleister Crowley. <laughs> Who would have ever thought you'd be on a bookshelf next to him, right? Yes, right. You know, he's someone who, when you start researching the occult, just always pops up. Oh, definitely. A lot of people who actually knew him thought he was an awful shit, though. Oh, yeah. Even his mom called him the Great Beast, so he must have been an awful shit, for sure. But anyways, John Crowley, thank you so much for being here. Before we get into your work, I wanted to talk a little bit about your upbringing. I know you grew up, for the most part, in Indiana. I also grew up in the Midwest. I was born and raised in Ohio. I still live here. Uh, and I was wondering how being raised in the Midwestern environment, which does seem to have its own flavor in terms of culture and ideals, I was wondering how that shaped your perception of the world around you growing up, you know, histories, philosophies, general ideas and morals presented in your childhood. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I actually, until I was uh, in the fourth grade, uh, however old that is, I lived in Brattleboro, Vermont, and my family is uh, sort of more connected. My parents are sort of more connected to New England than to anywhere else. But after uh, the end of my fourth grade, my father took a job in Kentucky. He was a doctor. He got a job as the medical director of a small Catholic hospital in a tiny town in coal mining, Kentucky. And the family spent a couple of years there, and um, we were my. We had I had four sisters, and three of them and me uh, were homeschooled by a nun who was sent up to our house from the hospital. I mean, if you've read the Egypt stories, yeah, I was just thinking that this is Pierce Moffat's childhood. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, I said it wasn't. I wasn't living with an uncle, but with my father and mother. That that only lasted for a couple of years. My I think that uh, my parents just felt a kind of cultural uh, deprivation. They just finally couldn't stand anymore. And at that point, my father got a job teaching, as not teaching, but as the uh, doctor at the infirmary, student infirmary at Notre Dame. Uh, so that's where I that's I moved there. I to Indiana in I guess 1952 or three when I was um, going into the seventh grade. And there I was until I left Indiana in 1964 to go to New York. So and you are right that I was definitely influenced by growing up in Indiana. Uh, but frankly, I 
never really felt like a Hoosier. <laughs> and friends of mine, a friend of mine, one in particular who was born and grew up in Indianapolis, and I knew very well in college and afterwards in New York, always kept insisting that I was a Hoosier. And I kept saying, no, I'm not a Hoosier. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so but the, actually, the thing I would say, say that influenced me far more than than actually Midwestern things, though I, I'm sure they're all down buried in there, and I represented a lot in my novel, uh, The Translator, which is about growing up in Indiana. But I think that uh, growing up Catholic was much more of an influence than being in Indiana, I would say. Yeah, I would think so, too. Being raised Catholic, you obviously have a distinct view of world history, which I think can be found in some of your work. And then there's this other history, the secret or occult history that's ever present in your work. So let me rephrase that first question then. How did growing up Catholic influence your worldview and your work? Well, it's uh, it's a hard thing to parse in some ways because, I mean, it was pervasive. Um, I was one of uh, five children, and my father when I went from, was born and raised Irish Catholic in, in Massachusetts. My mother was a convert. Uh, she converted when she married him, but we were a very strong, committed Catholic family. It was, as we regarded it, something more like uh, a club or a nation we belonged to than church. I mean, we, we went to Mass every Sunday, just like all good Catholics were supposed to do. We followed all the rules and stuff like that. And we were believers, but I personally, and I think at some at various times in their lives, my sisters too, and at the end of their lives, my parents never really um, had a big commitment to God and a religious view of, of the universe. My father always felt that somehow there were he was he was given to what I have heard it's called a heresy. I'm not sure. A heresy of two churches. The church for ordinary people who believe in saints and holy water and, you know, miracle stories and, you know, uh, blessed rosaries and all that kind of stuff. And then there is a, a Catholic church for smarter people who know that all that stuff is just fine and, you know, it's uh, good to believe in stuff and it will help you be a good person and get to heaven and all that. But it, you don't need to believe in any of that stuff that you, you you are sort of you know, beyond that kind of uh, low level of uh, sort of entertaining uh, culture. So, you know, we felt ourselves to be a little smarter than most Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, uh, partly because in Indiana, when my father was a doctor at the infirmary, his friends were all priests. You know, he, made, he knew the priests who taught classes in philosophy and science and so on at the at, the, at college. And he invited them over to dinner. Our you know, best friend of the family was an Irish priest who was taught history and, and logic of science at Notre Dame. So we, we did feel like we were kind of a, a, an elite in a way. But that doesn't mean that we weren't deeply, I mean, imbued with it. You can't help but be, as you know, if you grew up in it. And we grew up in the old church, you know, the fast on Fridays, Latin sacraments, blessings of throats on St. Blaise's Day, and all that kind of stuff. That is now, I think, severely diminished. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know much about the modern Catholic Church. I'm actually more familiar with the version of it that you just described, just from my own reading and research. I've never been to, to Catholic Church, but from what I've heard, though, uh, from friends and acquaintances who do still go, it has changed quite a bit, as you said. John, is it a stretch, then, to say that you, as an artist, and on some level, too, I think you're a scientist, based on the things you write about and, and research, is it a stretch to say, then, that you don't think the religious and scientific worldviews conflict? Oh, no, I've never, I've never felt that way. I've never felt that way. Now, I should, I should be clear that I haven't been mass in, you know, 50 years. <laughs> but uh, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm still not, I'm not deeply connected to it in my, in my nature. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't think that they conflict. And, and the, the picture of the world that, uh, that I learned from, from, especially from these priests that my father knew at Notre Dame, uh, you wouldn't, you, they were very you know, intelligent and uh, um, broad-minded people. I remember 
Father McMullen, the Irish priest who, who did uh, science at Notre Dame, came back from a conference he went to and uh, told us about an argument or a discussion he'd gotten into with somebody else about the nature of time. And uh, as he told us, <laughs> the position that he took on time, after they discussed for a while, meant that uh, it, it actually did not admit of the existence of angels. His version of time wouldn't have allowed angels to exist. The other guy, the scientist guys, would allow <laughs> angels to exist, formally speaking, though he was an atheist and didn't believe in angels. And the priest thought this was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is pretty funny. There's a great uh, quote about time from St. Augustine that I think you're familiar with. Oh, yeah, we know, yes. In fact, I've, I've, I've quoted it in, in, in essays. It says, uh, as for time, what is it? You know, I know what it is. But if anybody asks me what it is, I can't tell them. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I just love that. Speaking of your writing, then, uh, my next question is kind of long, uh, and it may lead to some conversation about literary theory. But your writing specifically has been subject to the great debate of genre fiction versus mainstream fiction, and all these labels, publishers, and I guess fans, too, throw on books. And I've, I've seen you say something to the effect of, you know, I just write books. I was reading an interview, actually, um, the other day that you did with The Believer, uh, McSweeney's great magazine, but this was back in 2009, and you said that people don't see movies, for example, by genre that they just go watch whatever's popular or whatever looks interesting. And you were hoping that books would become that way, that there'd be no need to label them one genre or another. And you said this, like I said, seven years ago, 2009. And I was just wondering if you'd seen that change come to fruition, you know, in a more complete way yet. Because I do think that change started before you said that in 2009, but it, it might have been still going uphill. I wonder if, maybe if it's come downhill yet. Oh, yes, absolutely. I've seen it. I mean, I've, it has been changing from before then. It's been changing for for longer than that, but it definitely has. I It's quite remarkable to me how much it has changed in the last 10 years and to the point where nobody is surprised at all to see a book reviewed in the New York Times and the regular book columns that uh, is about time travel or set in the future or set in a dystopian, uh, imaginary dystopian country or full of ghosts or all of these things that were once restricted to that kind of fiction that was in a certain part of the bookstore and not in the other parts of the bookstore. And I think that's terrific. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great liberation. Um, I mean, if you look back, of course, what is, this has also done is taken into the genre the thing we writers of genre or those labeled as writers of genre kind of believe were ours to enjoy but uh the literary people wouldn't want to give them over to us be writers like kafka and cervantes and any number of writers of uh, um henry james uh and it would have not allowed us to count as our forebears or our beginnings or our possessions and now you know, nobody cares. It's all open. It's all it's all available to anyone, which I think is a terrific thing. Yeah, and when you look at popular films, they're mostly fantasies. They are yeah. mostly fantasy. Now that you can you can also make a judgment and say, okay, there's a, there is a spectrum there too, so that you know superhero films are at one end of that spectrum, and very complex and delicately woven fantasy. Uh, or is, is that another end of that, you know, uh, something like let the right one in or some really sophisticated, uh, fine work. They're very different in, 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 lot, in many ways, but they're not any different than, you know, silly, obvious comedies or detective stories are from complex, uh, sophisticated, beautifully thought out, uh, films in the realistic mode. So each has a spectrum, but now the spectrums are all mixed together. You're right. It doesn't. It really doesn't matter. You, you go to the Cineplex and you can pick. You know, there's an awful lot of fantasy films in there, but there's also a lot of other thing, other films too, and a lot of films that you can't really put your finger on and say whether it's fantasy or not. I think this is great. It gives so much more opportunity uh, for people like me and people like Kelly Link and 
Amy Bender and a whole bunch of other writers that I admire to work in exactly the way they want. And nobody will, uh, nobody will mind. Everybody will just say, hey, what's this? Yeah, genre matters in a bookstore for some reason, but it doesn't matter when you walk into a movie theater. I've always found that interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. I don't know. That's, that, that, that's intriguing. I don't know why that is. Of course, way up in the front of the bookstore, you'll see a lot of fantasy. You know, that's where you'll find Mockingjay and uh, those books. and you'll, That's where you'll find Harry Potter books. It's probably up at the front of the store because they know everybody wants to read those. But they still believe there's a set of these books that only people want to read who don't read anything else. So they put them in a separate uh, yeah, part yeah. of the store. Yeah, I mean, you turn on the TV and the most popular show that everyone talks about seems to be Game of Thrones, this really fantastical story, this high fantasy that you had to dig through the science fiction fantasy section in the bookstore to find years ago. Mm-hmm. But it is nice to see this shift in the publishing industry for the last 20 or 25 years or so. Hey, we're touching on film here, and it's probably a good time to point out that you have some documentary film writing experience. Mm-hmm. Have you done any work in that realm lately? I don't think I've seen anything recent. Actually, what, I mean, basically I am, I am working on a documentary right now. It's it's produced and and directed by my wife, who I worked with on documentaries for quite a while. She was more working for me in old times, and now I'm working for her. She's doing a biography for television of Helen Keller that will eventually be broadcast on American Masters. I worked with her on that quite a bit. But I don't get the kind of uh, documentary jobs I used to get, partly because I don't look for them. I think I stopped stopped looking for that kind of work when I got a job teaching at Yale because I no longer sort of needed it. I mean, that part of my income that wasn't from books uh, was coming from someplace else other than documentary film. And also, uh, I mean, I worked specifically for four or five different producers, and they all either left the business or grew old or, you know, uh, stopped working or one of one way or another, I didn't have the kind of contacts uh, that I would have needed to keep up in order to get that kind of work. I was never made documentaries. I was always a hired worker on documentaries. I worked on them as a writer and sort of contributing thinker guy, but I never produced any of my own. It's interesting, too, that your fiction writing seems to be very research-intensive, documentary films obviously are very research intensive. Seems like a couple of good mediums for someone who apparently loves to do research to work in. (laughs) I do like research, and I I don't know if you've ever read Thomas Pynchon's uh, Slow Learner. No, I've read two of his novels, but I haven't read Slow Learner. Slow Learner is a a collection of some of his early stories, and they're very Thomas Pynchon-y stories. You'd you'd like them very much, but he has a, a, a long prefatory essay in there. And when she praises research, she says, you've got to do your research. Research is wonderful. Research is the soul of books. <laughs> I agree with that. I mean, I'll, yes, it's true that very many of my books uh, depend on research and ex- ter- external sources of, of information and weirdness that I can import into the, into the stories that I'm telling. And it is. It is related to how I worked in documentary films. I mean, the thing about, I mean... I just loved looking at old movies of people who are dead. You know, I uh, just—it's so fascinating to me. Just watch it. when when I started working on historical documentaries, uh, which are different from you know all documentaries. These are the ones that are made out of old footage and old uh, stuff. I do depend on research, and I just found myself fascinated looking at this—the stuff that is piled up in the archives. You can still access, how interesting and vivid and touching some of it was. It was just remarkable. Stories of people building palm shelters in the 1950s, and, you know, whether they've got to put a gun in with their uh, baked beans and their encyclopedia and stuff like that. And I just would just stare at them in amazement. Stories about that every year, apparently, in the newsreels in the 1930s, uh, they would have a story about the person who won the Irish sweepstakes that year. The Irish sweepstakes were this enormous thing. They were like they were like the Powerball prizes now, but they were actually Irish. There was a sweepstake in Ireland that everybody in the world could take, get tickets in. 
So somebody would win, I don't know, $100,000 in the, in the uh, Irish sweepstakes, which seemed like a vast amount of money in the 1930s. And they would interview these people and, and ask them what they were going to do with their money and why they thought they'd won. And one guy, this guy with a kind of uh, middle European accent, is showing us his dog and saying, it's my dog. My dog bought me this luck, and that's why I'm going to go take good care of this dog. <laughs> this is crazy stuff. And it was, like I say, some of it was scary and so it was touching and I just it was wonderful to work with and then it was wonderful to put things together in movies documentary films that didn't that, that didn't come that way out of the archives you took them and you put this next to that and this scene next to that scene and it was like writing a book it was like writing a series of uh, units that made a general picture as you put them together just the way at least the I is the way I write books anyway so you write in a nonlinear fashion and then put things together later? It's not that so much as that I know that that is the, uh, that's what I like to do in writing. I like to have those kinds of scenes that knock against each other or pair up with one another. Sometimes I write them consecutively. Not always, though. I tend to write in general uh, when I sit down to write uh, of a day. I just, uh, I start writing what I can, right? I mean, if I know, if I've been thinking about a scene or a unit or whatever, I've got a good picture of that, I'll write it no matter where it is in the book. Because I have, I have a very clear idea in, in my books of what, what the book is about long before I begin. I don't write an outline or anything like that, but I know in general the entire course of it. What's, what are the big turns and big events that are going to make it go? So I can usually write scenes anywhere in, in the story. I mean, a lot of it is written consecutively, but that doesn't need to be. I can always start out someplace else. It gives you problems later on because you write something you really like, and then by the time you really do get up to that place in the book, you say, oh, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. I, yeah. I have to change it. And I hate rewriting, so I always find this difficult, trying to squeeze things in rather than having to rewrite them. Yeah, I'm not a fan of rewriting either. And hey, I have one more question about research before we move on to some of your books and some ideas and themes in them. But do you find that you learn more about the subjects you're writing about when you're writing them as opposed to when you're researching them? Um, that's, it's, that's a very interesting question, and, it, and, it's a, and it's a kind of a craft question, I think. I think, I mean, the, the most recent book that where this really intense research went into it well, the two that did. One was the translator, but that was a little different because I felt like I was writing about my own life in that book. I did that. I grew up. I wrote poetry like that. I went to that kind of school, all those things. I got caught up with communists in, in college, and all, all that's really very autobiographical. But Four Freedoms, my most recent novel, had nothing to do with me. None of the characters are based on anything I've done or almost nothing I've done. They're all individuals that have just come up in, in my head because they... The book needs people like that. And as I, would, as I was writing it, the thing that made those people real to me was that they did things and said things and looked at things and owned things and, and thought about things that were coming out of my research. So it wasn't like I thought I had research on the one hand and characters on the other. It was completely blended together. So I was writing a, I'm writing a... Uh, section of dialogue, the things people would do, the things they would take out of their pockets, the snappy remarks they'd make, the things they were looking at were all coming out of me at the same time as their characters as expressed in their needs and feelings and talk. It was amazing. It was the most wonderfully enjoyable book I've ever written just because of that, just because I felt like I was, I had a, somehow, I don't know quite how, a, earned a mastery over this uh, milieu that felt like I could just go on with it as though I were living there, and that the, that the people and the and uh, I mean I still I still had to look up stuff constantly to make sure that I was right or make sure that I'd find this or that detail and so on. But in general, I just felt like I had a mastery of the feeling and flavor of things that made it less like one unified experience to write about people and love affairs and troubles and and sex and everything and, and, and blend it completely with the milieu and the language and the feelings and the attitudes of the of people at the time. 
It was just great. You know, the more I listen to you talk, the more I hear this Pierce Moffat character coming out of you. Because Pierce, in the Egypt cycle, is a researcher. He's at least trying to write a book. Yep. And I'm firmly of the belief that a lot of fiction is autobiographical. And I guess so. I guess I'll ask this first question about Egypt then. Um, obviously, you said Pierce's childhood was similar to your own. But the rest of Pierce's journey is very interesting in this story. Uh, is that similar to your own as well? Um, it is in a way. I mean, I think that uh, one of the things about Pierce is that he never does achieve anything. In the end, his book never gets written after all those hundreds of thousands of pages. Uh, never gets finished. It's abandoned, basically. But it, yes, it is kind of autobiographical. I think that he... Well, here's the thing, is that as the book goes on, it becomes, over, as you know, over the course of at least the first three volumes, harder and harder to not think that these magic uh, transformations of the world and this sense that there's going to be this gigantic change coming, which is going to change, you know, even the physics of the way things work in the world, it, it just makes it impossible to have a sort of separated vision of the material that he's researching. Uh, he can't be objective about it. It gets into his soul. And I don't think that ever happened to me uh, in the way that it happens to him. I mean, I wrote a whole book about fairies, you know, uh, a little big. And mm -hmm. I have people asking me if I believe in fairies. I say, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> and likewise, the, the, the thing that interested me, and it interests Pierce at the beginning of his journey, certainly, is how these huge intellectual structures, like alchemy and astrology and the system of spiritual uh, hierarchies, so how did it all come to be that it could be so lived in by people of the past? And that's, that gave rise to this metaphor that, you know, really, at some time in the past, this was so. There really were spiritual hierarchies, and, and astrological influences really did change the world. Um, but that is metaphorical. But what interested me was just the idea that people had once been so different from me that they could actually live in a, in a, in a, in a mental universe that consisted of this crazy thing. Uh, I was just, I was amazed. Yeah, and that theme of the secret history of the world really starts in Little Big with the fairies and the drink waters. Uh -huh. And it continues through the entirety of the Egypt cycle. And some of the characters in these books do believe that their fates are intertwined with this secret history. And I think the women in the Drinkwater clan feel this way more so than other characters in Little Big. And in Egypt, I think, you know, Pierce definitely believes this. I think Boney Rasmussen and Fellows Craft do as well. Definitely. And, you know, th we should say that this secret history that we're talking about has to do with these occulted sciences like the Hermetica, alchemy, astrology, and magic, and I think Gnosticism, too, is part of this. Oh, definitely, yeah. In fact, it's, it's sort of the most uh, inclusive of all in some way. Yeah, and there's a lot of people who swear by the Hermetica, who swear by the Gnostic texts, who say these things aren't a matter of belief that alchemy and astrology and magic contain a lot of truth about our world, a lot of truth that's been purposefully kept hidden, and... To be honest, I'm maybe one of those people. I'm not quite sure yet, and that's one of the reasons I started this podcast, to be honest, to just explore these ideas. They're very interesting to me. Uh -huh. You know, the novels we're touching on, A Little Big in Egypt, they seem to operate under the premise that the spiritual realities or the teachings of Hermeticism and Gnosticism might not be true now, but they were at one point in the past, which you characterize as a different world, so to speak. Well, that, that's, like I say, that's the metaphor on which the Egypt stories are based, and, and in a certain way, a little bit, too. And by the way, the translator also has this layer of spiritual realities above the mundane, which may or may not be, you know, causing things to happen. So, yeah, it's in a lot of my work. Here's what I think. If there are two separate worlds, one of them is the world inside human creations, like books and movies and poems and, and paintings and art. That is a realm in which these things are real. And I'm saying that, I don't say that because, I mean, I'm not, I'm not I've got no uh, scare quotes around that word real in that case. It is real in that realm. And it is a separate realm. In the realm outside of, of art and culture, which you, 
the human beings are never entirely outside the realm of culture and art and thought and religion and all those things. You're never outside of it entirely. But in the actual physical world in which I belong, I do not somehow have a trust in those things that acting according to their principles would actually effect change in the world, if you see what I mean. I would not do alchemy in order to, in order to get gold. I would not, I can't use the kinds of mental arts that I invest in, in books. So that, to me, is the difference. And I'm, what I'm not sure, then, what's interesting to me is, when I finished Little Pig, I thought, oh, this, I, whoever else buys this book, Whoever else gets interested in this book, the people who believe in this kind of other world that is uh, hidden within our world, these people are going to really eat this up. This is going to be great. I'm going to have a lot of readership among those people. And I never have had. My books are not read by and taken up by people who really believe in this stuff. I think they, at least not, a, not as far as I know, they're, they're beloved by fantasy readers and readers of books like this, but not people who actually invest in the belief in it, in the, in the world. And the only thing I can believe is that somehow they suspect that I'm not talking about the real world. I'm, this is not a sort of a encoded story about the actual base realities, but is just a book. If you, if you, read, a, if you read a book like uh, Narnia, the Narnia books, or even Tolkien, there is a sense in which he really is talking about another world, the existence, in metaphoric terms, of the existence of a spiritual realm. And you know it when you're reading them. But I think when you're reading my books, you might just suspect the soft trick, <laughs> which it is. Yeah, I was going to say that. Like, with the way the Egypt cycle ends, I got the impression that it was a trick or like an illusion of some sort. I felt like I'd been duped on some level. But to be honest, I enjoy that as a reader. I enjoy being tricked. And it fit in, too, with the general theme of the work. I mean, why wouldn't you play a trick on the reader in a series that mostly takes place in a world where magic exists? I applaud you for that, if that was your intention. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If you don't know, I think this is, I mean, I don't think I'm going to reveal anything here that, that an attentive reader wouldn't be able to figure out. Uh, I would hope, anyway. But you notice that if you lined up all four of the books of the of the the Egypt series, the first three books, each of the three first three books gets bigger than the previous one. Right? Mm -hmm. So that uh, the monomania is the biggest one. What it is is there's a certain of impulse in the first three books for this magic realm to get larger and larger and larger, and take in more and more and more, and become more and more sweeping as the supposed uh, change draws near as this time of where anything can happen gets bigger and the theoretical um, underpinning being that the world is going to have to take some sort of path at the end of this uh, that will be different and it's up to human beings thinking human beings to make, to, to make that choice to make that path and that goes on right up to the end of the monomania, in which one kind of change, one kind of awful change, is working as a possibility, kind of represented by the powerhouse and uh, those kind of people, right. is deflected, is saved. We're saved from that. Pierce, uh, all unknowing and fucked up as he is, manages to do the one thing. <laughs> He has to do. He finds out where Sam, the baby, the child, is being kept, and she gets rescued from the bad guys, and her rescue saves the world. And then, when Pierce, at the very end of the Monomania, is climbing up the mountain, and he meets this child, this ghost child, this god, this whatever, has a long conversation with her about what he, uh, what he would like to do, or like, and she says. He says, well, I'll tell you what I want. I just want to have it not be what I want. I want not to have my wishes come true. I just want to have this world be the plain world that I began, and I want to just lie down in it and return to Earth and have that to the end of it. And she says, well, that's what you want. That's what you've got to make. And that's the world that endless things takes place in. 
right up to the end, in, in which and I've had people complain to me, uh, either in comments on, you know, blogs or whatever, or in person, that they're very disappointed with, the, with endless things because it just seems to, like, lose all of this magical and wonderment that was the soul of the first three books. I said, well, you didn't get it then. <laughs> <laughs> you, the idea is that the universe story, the universe history, whatever, goes through these changes, and the, what the resulting world is what people choose to make of them. Well, this is the world we live in. We did go through that change. We can't remember it now, because it's always been this way now. Mm -hmm. We made this world. <laughs> and uh, it's a perfectly ordinary world in which guys get teaching jobs and have kids and, you know, do the best they can. Yeah, but there are a lot of people out there that I think want to, um, I don't know what the right word is, maybe reconcile this old world? Yeah, I know, that's true. But I, I know it just changes. It doesn't reconcile. Mm -hmm. It comes to a certain point, you know? And, that, you know... The, the original title of Endless Things that I found I just couldn't couldn't use, it was just too complicated. I was going to call it A Why. A Why. A Why. Wow, that would have been great, because the why does play a big role in that book. Yes, yeah, why is like, the, the book starts with the letter Y, and there's why throughout. Everybody talks about why and different ways of taking turns on Y-shaped paths and so on. And that's what it's about. It's a, it's a point at which you take one turn rather than another. And when you've taken one turn, it's the only path that's ever existed. Because we're only on one path. There aren't two. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, there's a choice. And once you made the choice, the, the choice you didn't make vanishes forever. Or becomes an object and a, an artifact and a part of history. You know, when I first started reading about people like John Dee and Edward Kelly and Giordano Bruno, uh, Francis Yates, who all appear as characters in your novels, I found it hard to resist the idea that their world was absolutely, undoubtedly real. And I still don't know what to make of all of it, but I know that for a moment I was certainly one of the people who wanted to reconcile this world. It was resonating with me, and to be honest, it still does. I think it's safe to say it resonated with you on some level, too, or that you at least find the ideas compelling? Yeah, fascinating. I mean, John D. One of the most interesting people you could study. I've seen people call him the Gnostic James Bond because he was a spy for Queen Elizabeth's court and signed his name 007 in correspondences to her and even advised her on things like astrology. Yeah. And then Bruno, another interesting cat. His cosmology, John, just fascinates me with his infinite universe and cosmic pluralism theory and his writings on the art of memory. He seems to have been one of the first dualistic thinkers, you know, and, and then being burned at the stake for heresy. I love heretics for some reason. But, you know, how hard was it for you to resist this world? Because I got to be honest, it is very, very hard for me to resist it. Uh, I, I don't know. I think, I think I am kind of, in a certain way, immune to them as actualities. I mean, I can perceive them and I can delight in them, but it's but it's the same way I delight in I don't know Shakespeare right. or Mozart. Um, I get swept away with them. I get caught up in them. I laugh I, in a kind of uh, <laughs> the kind of laughter that uh, I don't know how to express it, but you probably know what I mean. You get to some Bruno saying some absolutely crazy thing and it's wonderful and it's an amazing daring thing to just view the universe that way and all you can do is laugh it's just so amazing but it's, it's sort of like you know Augustine St. Augustine said talked about something he called Kapox Dei which means like the uh, capacity for God that you have to have in order to really be um, you know a saint you have to have this capacity to have God in your heart and to know God and long for God and know God when you see God and feel his presence in the world, so on and so on. I have no cockpox day. Even when I was growing up as a Catholic, you know, like I never was moved, really, by thoughts of God at all. I never even thought of him as particularly punishing or anything like that, like a lot of Catholics. You know, kids growing 
I mm-hmm. feel guilty. You know, I never felt anything about it. <laughs> and but I was deeply in it, and would argue for it. And I went to Catholic high school, and you know, uh, hung out with these priests at Notre Dame. And so I was living in it, but not in its real essence. The thing that's most important to it, to believers, which is it really true. I, it wasn't that I thought it wasn't true. In fact, I can remember a day when I said to myself, I, was, I can remember the moment. It was a, a feast of the Assumption, I think. Anyway, I've been to Mass. It was a holy day of obligation, as they used to have them. You had to go to Mass on certain days of the year besides Sunday. And I was walking home, and suddenly I said to myself, I don't really, I don't care about this stuff anymore. I just don't care. I was probably 16, 15, 16. I had nothing against it. I had no arguments against it. I wasn't thinking I could prove it to be untrue. For all I knew, it was true. I just couldn't do it. I could no longer participate in it. I guess it's kind of like that with this, with all of this Gnosticism. And when I when I discovered the Gnostic stuff, and when I read it, um, the book of the Gnostic Heresy, I was so touched by this Gnostic concept this idea of, of that we're all sort of cast into this dark world and don't know where we come from and we've lost our way. And, and the idea of this Sophia was, uh, was cast out of the realm of the gods and had to fall down and through the darkness and, and her tears and her sufferings created matter and earth. And that just was so moving to me. It was, I mean, I almost, at that, I came as close <laughs> as I've ever come to saying, I, I think this is really true. <laughs> this did happen this way, this 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 thing. But I, in fact, in the end, I can't come up and say it's true. But I still remain enormously touched by it. it was, I, I had never known about it before. In fact, it was I, I discovered this Gnostic stuff quite late in the in the uh, in the writing of the Egypt books. Oddly enough, since it's in there almost from the beginning. It's not true to say that I came to it late in the writing. I came to it late in the thinking. I had been thinking about Giordano Bruno uh, and John Dee since I first picked up Francis Yates somewhere around 1967 or 68. And I didn't actually start writing the first pages of the Egypt books until somewhere around uh, 1982 or so. So there's a long period of <laughs> where yeah. I was thinking. And I only discovered the Gnostics right around the, the early 80s. So it really, it did form part of my thinking then, by then, so that even the very first opening sections of the first book, the prologue in, on Earth and the prologue in Heaven, are, you can read them as Gnostic too. The Pierce little boy going to a church and in the darkness and seeing to be an older boy and feeling alone in a world that, you know, it doesn't belong to and all that kind of stuff is definitely uh, affected by by Gnostic thought. But it got much richer as the book went on and I learned more and more. And I, it was just tremendously touching to me. And I think that's as close as I ever got to really believing in that kind of, oh, the world explained in that way, the universe explained in that way. Okay, so this brings this uh, nature of reality question into my mind. Is there a consensus reality, or is reality just a matter of individual belief? Uh, I th- I <laughs> yes, there's a consensus reality, but that doesn't mean it makes it the only reality. Hmm. I mean, consensus reality that's been going on in human mentality for, you know, I don't know how many thousands of years... Uh, it is pretty, um, you know, it's pretty solid. It's pretty clinker built. And uh, for long stretches in there, they believe that these things, these spiritual entities and spiritual dimensions were real. And getting rid of them or, de- or de- departing from them, leaving them behind or whatever, doesn't seem to have gotten rid of them or changed them. So I don't know quite what, what you mean by uh, consensus reality if it doesn't include those kinds of spiritual dimensions. I mean, it does, obviously it does, but you don't believe in, I mean, you know, you probably are not an anti-vaccinator or, uh, you know, a uh, chemtrail believer, you know, 
there's a certain consensus about those things, too. So I think that the whole human universe is, there's nothing solid in it. There's nothing final in it. I mean, when you can come up with dark matter, you know, and find out that the universe is twice the size. Yeah. <laughs> without changing any, any, any of its characteristics, turns out to be twice as big as you thought it was. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. Yeah, and... But then again, it could just be pure chaos. Uh, well, it's, a better, better, it's better than chaos. Better than chaos. Okay. Because it has lots and lots of ordered and beautiful parts. And it's, and it's not chaotic in, in the sense that nothing makes any sense. And it's all just a... I guess I meant more random. Yes, it's, it's random and can produce random beauties. And things collect and gather and, and like clouds. You say, oh my God, how gorgeous. And then it vanishes and it's gone. The things like that that I think are... are, are, uh, are permanent parts of, of human experience. It's just that none of them is final. Well, I like that answer. And I wanted to ask you, too, about Latin. You use a lot of Latin in your books. Latin seems to me to be more of a part of the secret history that we've been talking about, because it's died off as a spoken language. I know it's still taught and studied as a written language in some places, but where did your interest in Latin come from? Was it from Catholic mass growing up or some other reason? Well, it, it, you were proud of it when you were a little kid. I mean, I was an altar boy starting when I was about 11 uh, down in Kentucky because they didn't have any other, and there were almost no Catholic you know, little kids down there. We went to a church. There wasn't a church, unlike the thing pictured in my book. There wasn't a church in the little town we lived in. We used to go to church in the in the hospital where my father was a doctor. There was a little chapel there. Where, and that's where I first became an, an altar boy. Well, I was an altar boy from age 10 to age, you know, 13 or so. Uh, and I couldn't, at that time, understand the Latin. As, as altar boys, you didn't ever, I mean, you, you learned to say it. It was like, <laughs> it was like you know, uh, people reciting the Koran without knowing, you know, what it, Arabic means, or uh, people reciting Sanskrit prayers just because they've made, you know, memorized the sounds. I mean, I would, you could piece out some of it, figure out some of it. And you knew what it meant. I mean, you memorized a, a text that had a meaning, showed you the meaning next to it, so you knew it. But I just loved the sound of it. I just liked the, the and also the, secret, the sense of having a secret language in the same way that, you know, you could possess Sanskrit. And then I started, I started studying Latin when I was a freshman in, in high school, partly because in the Catholic school that I went to, you had to. I mean, there were two kind of tracks in, in a lot of schools, but uh, in, in uh, Catholic high schools, there was a track, it was a sort of academic track, and anybody who was on that would take two years of Latin. Everybody had to take one year of Latin. Even if you were going to, you know, major in shop, you know, you had to, or drafting, you still had to take a year of Latin, which, of course, everybody probably forgot. But I took four years of, of Latin in high school. Really? Um, wow. Yeah, four year, I took four years of Latin in high school and then two semesters of Latin in college. So uh, I can't say that I ever really became fluent in reading it. Of course, nobody speaks it. Nobody has, mm-hmm. nobody has spoken Latin for an awful long time. But uh, um, I did come to uh, be able to hear and read a certain amount of it, especially the simple kind of Latin that uh, medieval Latin and the kind of Latin that Giordano Bruno wrote is, is not too hard to not too hard to understand. I'm not I'm no Latinist. I can't I can't pretend that I am. And I always will have to translate it rather than read it. Right. I have to sit down with a sentence of Latin. I say, well, here's the verb. And it's, and it's, uh, you know. Uh, and here's a, here's a noun, so the verb's got to be in the plural because the noun's in the plural. And I'll piece it out that way. I can't re- I can't read it straight off unless it's very simple. But I've also incorporated huge amounts of Latin cliches too. You know, you get all that. Well, I was going to say I appreciated the use of the ash. You know, the Latin diphthong that is in the title of the Egypt cycle and throughout the series. And I just love that character. It was a nice touch from you because it does allude to the secret history or secret world. You do notice that the last third of Egypt, of the end, of endless things, you probably notice it disappears. Yeah, you know, I wanted to bring that up and ask you why that was, but then I realized why that was. 
But hey, let's talk about now your new book that's coming out in November, The Chemical Wedding by Christian Rosenkreutz. This is one of those texts, uh, the original version of it, that you come across in studies of the occult. It's a very important text, particularly in the Rosicrucian movement. Uh, it's a text that helped start that movement, actually. So could you talk about when you were introduced to the text and why you wanted to update it? Well, I first came across The Chemical Wedding uh, in Francis Yates, where probably you first came across it. I don't mm-hmm. know. Uh, she mentions it in her earlier books, in her discussions of uh, John Dee and the, and the 17th century, early 17th century in Europe. She mentions it as a, as a text uh, that's, that she thinks is a kind of political allegory. She later developed that idea in um, her book called The Rosicrucian Enlightenment which talks about John Dee's, as she believes, John Dee's influence on the, on the writers and thinkers who gathered around this Rosicrucian movement. And she details this book. I hadn't read it when I read those books uh, of hers. And um, she takes this very weird book as a kind of political allegory of what was going on in the early 17th century that was going to actually end up with uh, the beginning of the uh, Thirty Years' War. And so there are so many connections between John Dee's writing and The Chemical Wedding, including the appearance in The Chemical Wedding, as it first appeared in German, of John Dee's famous little sign, the Monas Hieroglyphica, this uh, sign or symbol that he worked out that is supposed to express you know, all the forces of the universe in one little sign. And it appears on the first page of the, uh, the original German uh, edition of, of The Chemical Wedding. So she's right. I mean, it can't hardly be denied that somehow it's been, that the connection is there. And one of the original uh, treatises, Rosicrucian treatises or pamphlets or texts is... A, or contains an explication of the Monas hieroglyphica by John Dee. And it's, it's not John Dee's own writing, or at least it's not credited to him, but it is uh, definitely a magic text based on Dee's sign. So she's obviously right that he's connected to all this stuff. And I used it in that way in the Egypt books. Well, I had never really sat down with a text and and read it all until I got to toward the end of that book, that series. And when I finally read it, I thought, this is the weirdest thing I've ever read. This is a wonderful story. I don't, I don't actually, it, it convinced me that I'm not sure that uh, Frances Yates was entirely wrong, but I don't think she was, I don't think her theory really, it doesn't seem to me to be uh, all that convincing when you actually read the book. But, um, it is so strange. It's not like anything you think it's going to be. It's sort of funny. It's uh, It could be, one possibility is, it could be a parody of alchemical and Rosicrucian and esoteric writings. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, Valentin Andrié, who was the guy who actually wrote it, uh, though it, came, it appeared anonymously when it first came out, or actually, it appeared as though written by somebody named Christian Rosenkreutz. Uh, and so the title, Christian, uh, The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which is how it usually appears, gives the impression that it's Christian's wedding. It's not. It should say, The Chemical Wedding by Christian Rosenkreutz. He's the, he's the supposed author of the book. And it's a long story about him going to this magic castle, summoned by an angel or a, a, a sort of spiritual figure, to this castle where a wedding is going to happen, and uh, a king and queen are going to be, be uh, matched in marriage, and there's going to be a big party and all this kind of stuff. And what happens is that the king, the queen, uh, an older king and queen, are all uh, have their heads chopped off and are carried off in caskets to a tower across a bay, and they're transformed and reanimated by the guests at the wedding, who are actually a selected group of uh, uh, 
chemical workers and are brought back to life and returned to the castle as king and queen. And that's the wedding. Hmm. And even that doesn't express anywhere near how strange it is. Because there's all kinds of other things that go on as well. And it's just an enormous oddity and one of the great uh, wonder stories. But, but nobody knows what it was for or what you were supposed to make of it or anything. It's just not known. It's not a, it's not a pamphlet. It's not the kind of propaganda that the earlier Rosicrucian pamphlets are. It's not saying the Rosicrucians are invisible agents of divine power. They're moving among you even now and are going to effect a general change of the whole world and overthrow the Pope and the Emperor. And it's nothing like that. It's just a story about this old guy who goes to this crazy, bloody wedding. Yeah, and like you said, Yeats called it a political allegory. You alluded to the fact that it might be an alchemical allegory. I think it could also be a romantic allegory. Or is it possible, John, that it could be all three? Because the best fiction works on different levels. Could it have been all three? I think it is. I think it probably does. I think you're probably right. And and uh, may well be an allegory, a, a, a multiple allegory. And at the same time, well, hey, maybe if it is a triple allegory, which is it's not uh, not inconceivable, that would mean that these three different allegories are kind of canceling each other out at every point. And so that's what makes the, the text so uh, unreducible right. in any sense. I mean, Carl Jung, you know, this is one of his favorite books, The Chemical Wedding. He loved al alchemy in the first place. But he took the whole of alchemy as an allegory of you know, personal integration of the psyche and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But that was the, so, that was the uh, goal of the alchemical work, was the integration of, of personality. But that means... If alchemy is an allegory, and the chemical wedding is an allegory of alchemy, then it's an allegory of an allegory. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's no end to this. <laughs> it's like Inception, you know, the film, the dream within a dream. Dream, right, exactly. And speaking of, you know, science fiction-y stuff, I mean, you have called the chemical wedding the first science fiction novel, and you're the only person I've seen put that idea forward and most other people call Somnium by Kepler the first science fiction novel, but you're pretty steadfast that it's the chemical wedding. Oh yeah, I think I I mean I think it has much better claim than than than, uh, than Somnium. For one thing, Somnium was written a little bit earlier, a couple of years earlier than the appearance, first publication of Chemical Wedding, but it actually was published several years after. But also Somnium, I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's not really a story. I mean, it's not really a book. It's very short, for one thing. It's about 30 or 40 pages long, I would guess. And basically, it's more like um, an enacted lesson about lunar eclipses and the movement of the, uh, the Earth around the sun and stuff like that. They're all taught to this, this person who is taken up to view it all by these sort of space demons. Uh, and that's the whole story. And to me, Somnium is not li like a novel so much. Do you remember Magic Bus? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's like that. It's like the Magic Bus is going to go into a volcano and teach you about how volcanoes work. That's what it seems like to me. Uh, and there's not really any people in it. There are no characters. This is one person who gives the lessons and the other people teach the lessons. But that's about it. So I don't think it, I don't think it qualifies in a way. And besides, if you go by publication date, Chemical yeah. Wedding came out first. Well, so it's very disputed. People said, no, no, you can't have a science fiction novel that's not got science in some sense at its basis. Of course, you and I know you can you can toss dozens of science fiction novels at people and say, you try to find the science in there. It's anything more than, you know, words. You know, like quantum mechanics or whatever that you know that don't have anything to do with all the science. It's just a deployment of amazing possibility. Yeah, and that ties back to the genre talk we had earlier. You know, we could talk about someone like Philip K. Dick, especially his later, more metaphysical work. It's not science fiction at all, even though it's labeled that way. Oh no, it isn't at all. And your stuff is labeled fantasy, and it's not fantasy at all to me. I just I don't get these labels. And it's the same. Kelly Link stories aren't horror stories. It's just there's all these genre 
you know the, what happened about 10 years ago, or 10, maybe even more, they came up with this term slipstream. They were acting, there's, a, there are, there, there's a, this famous distinction between, and, and people who do archives, between gatherers and splitters. When you're making up, like trying to make files, fill file folders and stuff like that. You know, I'm talking about paper <laughs> folders mm-hmm. in the old days. There were, you know, there were people who would like put uh, documents in, you know, like give practically one folder for each document because they were all different in some way and could be labeled as different. But then there were gatherers who put a whole bunch of documents in one folder because they ought to belong together. And and you could have these kind of guys in your office. They could be you know, the gatherers or the splitters. And some people in science fiction and fantasy started to get to be splitters. They figured, well, we'll save science fiction as a genre by giving up these giving it these new names. You know, there's slipstream fiction, there's speculative fiction, there's this fiction, there's that fiction, and all they were doing was splitting up this genre uh, in order to give it kind of some sort of special nature. But what was really happening all along is just the thing you're talking about. All those all those distinctions were falling apart to the point where nobody really cares anymore what sort of name this kind of fiction has. So I think, yeah, I think The Chemical Wedding will fit right into this. And I'm, I'm happy to have it disputed whether it's the first science fiction novel or not. But, uh, I mean, I've made my case. But uh, it also doesn't really matter. What I really want is for people to enjoy this very strange and unlikely and uh, hilarious story. Yeah, it seems like this is a reintroduction of the story to the Western world, or maybe an introduction to begin with. I mean, it's known to people who have studied the occult, but it's pretty unknown at the mainstream level. It was the only people who knew about it and cherished it were the occult and esoteric readers who took it enormously seriously as some kind of something uh, in the allegorical or spiritual line. I just took it as a story, and my version is less kind of, how would you say, reverent than uh, the way the occultists have have generally treated it. And your version is also illustrated, right? It is. It's beautifully illustrated by a, a, a woman who lives nearby me here. And it's not heavily illustrated. It's only it was a panel of, of illustrations. They're wonderful, partly because... They kind of resemble, I don't know if you've seen them, but I actually they're in some of Francis Yates' books illustrated. This kind of um, wood engravings of that period, the early 17th century. Uh, Durer was the great master of it, but there's lots of like broadsheets and, and uh, propaganda pieces that have this kind of woodcuts. You know, these kind of grinning, ugly people. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, devils and, you know, stuff like that that are really fun to look at, but kind of, also kind of gross. She isn't like that, really, but you could look at her illustration, you say, you can see some of that, and, but it's her own style. It was the style that I saw in her, in her writing when I first saw her stuff. So, I think it's great. Well, that's really cool to hear. I actually love Durer, uh, particularly Melancholia 1. It's probably my favorite painting ever. And, you know, I thought I saw somewhere that earlier versions of The Chemical Wedding were also illustrated. Like, maybe they had some obelisks or something in one edition? I don't know about that. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I've never seen an illustrated, uh, an, an older illustrated edition. The, the only ones that I know of, I mean, I didn't look up the actual original editions themselves. Uh, but the German editions don't have any pictures in them. The first German editions that I, that I have seen, I have looked at online. And that a friend of mine who re- did some research for me in German, but the uh, original English edition I don't think was illustrated at all. It was, okay. it was done by a guy named Foxcroft, and uh, I don't think it was illustrated in any way. I don't okay. know. It'd be interesting to look at, the, at an illustrated edition. Well, I could be confused. I read a lot of stuff online, so I thought I had read that somewhere. But anyway, the last point that I want to touch on is something that I scribbled down while I was preparing for this conversation, and I think it may be the main theme of your work. It's only four words, and I wrote down, Souls Hungering After Meaning. I think that reflects in most of your work that I've read. It seems like it may even reflect 
on you personally. It definitely reflects on me personally. And, you know, now that I think about it, it reflects on everybody here on Earth right now. It's probably why some of us are drawn to things like religion and others to science. And then I guess even more of us are drawn to these occult teachings that we've been talking about, like the Hermetica and Gnosticism. We all seem to be desperately searching for meaning. <laughs> I, I, I think souls hungering after meaning is a very good... Uh, description of, of a lot of my work. Uh, I don't know that it covers all of it, but it certainly it certainly covers mm, possibly the largest uh, number of words. No doubt about it. It certainly covers much of Little Big and uh, the Egypt books and the translator. Others not so much, I guess. Not, well, I don't know. Even Ancient Summer, you could say, is a pursuit of is uh, soul hungering after meaning. And uh, finding it, <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, it's never, never good in the end. I mean, it, it can be a big uh, like what happens to poor Pierce Moffat. You know, be careful of that hunger after me. Yeah, I think that's not a that's not a bad description. Uh, you know, forward forward description comes closer as close as anything I can think of to what I've done. Yeah, and like you said, you do have to be careful when you go on that quest for meaning or truth or however you want to describe it. You may wind up like, you know, Buddha or Gandhi. You may wind up like Jack Parsons or Aleister Crowley. But anyways, John Crowley, thanks so much for your time here today. The Chemical Wedding by Christian Rosencruz is out in November. I don't know the exact date. I don't either. Still being produced. Okay. Are you still updating your live journal blog? No, I don't. Okay. I kind of gave it up. I was wonderful to do for a long time, but then I sort of fell into Facebook, I'm afraid. But I do have a Facebook presence if you want to sign on as a friend. It's kind of fun, too. All right. Well, maybe I'll see you on Facebook. And thanks for being on the first episode of O'Culture. All right. Good luck with it. All right. There you have it. The first episode of O'Culture in the books. Pun intended. My thanks again to John Crowley. Make sure you check out The Chemical Wedding by Christian Rosencruz when it hits bookstores in November. And my thanks to all of you who chose to spend a few minutes of your day with us. Again, this is Old Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.